We're turning in our Bibles this morning first to the book of Genesis. We're going to go back to the beginning before we really dig into our text. <clears throat> they tell me that there is a first time indeed for everything, correct? I can now safely say that I have worn a full suit in an RV camper. <laughs> it's quite the experience getting ready to come and preach this morning, um, getting a shower from a dripping bucket, something to that effect. It is a pleasure to be here. What a wonderful experience we always have uh, when we gather around the Word this morning. Let's bow our hearts one more time. Uh, we really need God to prepare our hearts for what we're going to be looking at this morning. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we do thank you for this uh, glorious day. We thank you for that sun that is shining outside. Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that as he is alive. Thank you that he lived a holy life for us, that... Um, that through him we would be redeemed, that we would have the payment for all of our sins. But Father, so much more. We thank you for um, the, the righteous life that he lived, that we might have freedom in you, and that we might uh, live your life uh, here to this lost and broken world. Father, as we're about to look at a very uh, delicate issue, as we look at uh, the role of women in our lives and in our homes and in our uh, corporate assemblies, in your church, Church, Father, I ask that uh, we would be able to take any preconceived ideas or notions or, or uh, thoughts that we might be having. Father, set them aside. Let, let your spirit uh, convict our hearts and, and help us see from your word what your truth is. And Father, I just ask that um, we be challenged and encouraged and that through this, each of us, both men and women, that we would uh, continue to be formed more and more to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, it's your honor, it's your glory, it's your praise. And your Son's precious name I pray. Amen. As we talk about the role of women this morning and the role of women in the church, I want to refer to a fairy tale. Not the fairy tale that you're probably going to think. You'd think maybe, well, we're going to talk about Cinderella. Or we're going to talk about Sleeping Beauty. No, I want to talk about Alice in Wonderland. Anybody familiar with that kind of common uh, turned upside down fairy tale? In that, uh, Alice is speaking to the Cheshire Cat. And so Alice goes, would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? And the, ch the cat replies to her, goes, well, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. Alice replies, she goes, well, I don't much care. And of course, the cat responds, and he goes, then it doesn't matter which way you go. If we don't have an ultimate destination of where we're going, we're never going to get anywhere. When it comes to the blueprints of our lives, when it comes to the end result of what it means for me to be a man of God, and for the ladies in this room to be a woman of God, we must see and understand and have an end goal in mind. Because without that end goal, we don't know where we're going. In our culture, it's a very lost idea. The idea of uh, gender is completely turned on its head. And in fact, in our, in our society, gender is almost completely washed away. Where we don't know up from down, we don't know man from woman in any sense of the word. So we need to lay this foundation first and foremost because this is crucial to the heart of what Paul is going to address in, uh, uh, for the, the churches that young Timothy was working with. So you're in your Bibles this morning. We're in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And if you look through the first three chapters or so, we have time and time again woven in and out, repeated in various different ways, at various depths and intricacies, the account of creation, the amazing start to the cosmos, to the world that all God has done. And he created uh, the lights, he created the sun, the moon, the land, the sea, and it continues and it grows into a crescendo, and after we have all of the animals, there's something that is missing. That thing that was missing was 
man, something that could and would bear the very image of God. And so we have that creation come to a crescendo as he creates Adam. But that was not enough. For from Adam he saw all of the animals and he saw that there was a boy animal, a girl animal. There were two, but there was only one of him. And so God came to the ultimate glory of his creation when he took from Adam his rib and he created a doubly refined woman. And we come to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. If this is not highlighted in your Bible, would you do so right now? Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Here we have written, So God created man, mankind, in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Now we get a little more specific. Male and female created he them. We do not just have mankind in general. God is a little more specific. God's a little bit more complex than just saying mankind. You see, we are created in the image of God. We are his image bearers. We can look at the world and we can see the order of the trees. We can see the orders of the seasons and the stars that run in their circuit. And we learn about God, that he is a God of power. He is a God of order. But God, to reveal more aspects of his character, he needed to create something far more refined, far more intricate, and that is man and that is woman. Each gender, men and women, have unique, a unique stamp upon them of aspects that we each portray of the image of God. I am unable to portray the feminine qualities of the character of God because I'm not equipped to. I'm not built to. That's not what I was created for. And vice versa. For the ladies in our room this morning, you are unable to bear the image of God in the way that I can because you're not supposed to. And this is the idea that we take with us as we come back into our key text this morning of 1 Timothy chapter 2. While you're turning in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2, men... I want you to listen up. This message is just not for your wives. It's not just for your daughters or the ladies in your life. This message is for you. Young men, listen up even closer. Because you might not have a spouse in your life yet, but one day there will be a spouse potentially and possibly for you. As we come to the Word of God, let this be an example to us of where we set our sights. Remember, if we don't know where we're going, how are we ever going to get there? I read a verse from us in 1 Peter chapter 3. We may reference this, this later if I have the opportunity to do it. But uh, for now, I read to you 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. And there's a good nugget for us men this morning. Here he says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them. That's speaking of your wives, with the women in your world. Husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, the more delicate, the more fragile portion of God's creation, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. I read that verse to you because what stands out to me is that he encourages them to uh, look at their wives according to knowledge. How many of us like to take tests? No, we all put our hands down. Nobody likes to take tests. Why? Because you have to study to take a test. You have to be prepared. So most of us avoid studying at all costs. But when I see that exhortation 
for us to dwell with our wives with knowledge. Do you know what that takes? Knowledge takes some effort. Knowledge takes some studying. Men, we need to study our wives. That's something that we're going to be looking at this morning. There are going to be tidbits for you this morning as well. So we're back in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to see that uh, across all women, of course, uh, we all have different temperaments. We all have different personalities. And to say that everyone is exactly the same is quite ludicrous because anybody who has children can tell you that one child is not the same as your second child. I am blessed with twin daughters. And though they shared a womb for nine months, and though they shared a birthday, those children are absolutely polar opposites. Yet both of those beautiful little girls bear the image of God in a, in a general way as women or as daughters of God, but then also in a more specific way as one daughter and as another daughter. And so uh, there are several common core principles that we can say about all women. And as we look into the passage this morning, we're going to reference these back and forth again. Many authors out there today and, and many uh, people that I've discussed, you know, when we look at the idea of, of gender identity and gender roles, there are many common um, commonalities that come out between this is what a man is and, and several ideas and this is what a woman is, several ideas behind that. And when we start to examine that and we look at that, we see that there are some common desires, some common things that are felt in the heart of every woman. There are conversely the same things that are experienced desires uh, of men that uh, need to be fulfilled as well. But with women, there are three common uh, core desires of a woman's heart. That as we go through this passage, we're going to relate the fact that each of these core desires, in fact, are met by God as we go through this passage. And as our desires are met by God, all of the issues, all of the troublesome things that we see creeping up and plaguing the world, there's no need for them. Why? Because we're resting, we're completely satisfied. We're resting in who we were created to be. You're resting in the fact that your desires are met in God, uniquely as a woman, uniquely as a man. So we go, we start in our passage, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We begin in verse 9. Here Paul says, in like manner also. Just when I thought we were going to be able to build some steam here, we have to stop. In like manner also. I can't even go on because I have to figure out what he's talking about. In like manner also. If we were to take a piece of string, we'd have to tag that string into this verse and we'd have to take it further back because Paul is attaching this thought to a previous thought. What is that previous thought? Verse 8. Here Paul says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Last night our brother Paul Sadler spoke on this verse and he highlighted for us that one of the things, uh, the, the main themes behind this verse is not the action. It's not the posture of the lifting up of the hands, but rather the focus of this verse is on the holiness that we lift up holy hands. And it's that holy heart that is behind uh, the, the action, behind that posture. And so as we look to the role of the women in the church, let's first approach this with the fact that we are coming to these instructions on godly terms. We're coming to these instructions saying, with holy hands, the heart, the holy heart is taken care of, and that is the goal. That is our foundation. And so we move on, and well, what does that look like? Okay, so the, the women, likewise, uh, maintaining holiness, maintaining a, a sense of godliness, bearing the image of God. Then what? 
Paul says this, in like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women, professing godliness with good works. Praise the Lord, I made it through the part of the, of the sermon that I thought I might get stoned, just like the Apostle Paul. When we read verses like this, many have taken these words, they've contorted them. They've twisted them around and they've put false ideas and they've, they've fit a square hole, uh, a square peg into a round hole, trying to twist things and make things fit where they don't. Many people get caught up in these verses and we look at all of these rules and we turn this into a checklist of what it is to be a woman of God. Look at me this morning. This is not a checklist for you to follow. It is a checklist. It is, there is a heart that is to this passage that is going to help each of us uh, do exactly what uh, we're supposed to be doing. First, we look in this passage that, we, uh, that women of God are to be adorned by God himself. That the women are to be adorned by God. Now, Paul does use the word adorn in this passage here. He says that they are to be adorn themselves in modest apparel. Well, where did I... Okay, if you're supposed to be adorned by God, that's not the same as adorned by modest apparel. Well, first let's figure out what, what is the word adorned mean. Remember just a little bit ago when we were kind of laying the foundation for what we're talking about this morning. And I said, in the beginning, God created the world. He created the heavens and the earth. He created the cosmos. All right, that is the created orderly world in which we live in. That very word is, is at the root of the word adorn. It's a different form. It's an adverb right here in this, in this passage, in this word. But at the essence, at its core, it is this word. And it bears with it the sense of orderly, of uh, place in proper order, or to decorate. And so from that, uh, think of a Christmas tree, where we have a tree. And when you're creating a Christmas tree, when you're adorning it, what are you doing it? You're ordering it in such a way that it creates a cohesive thing of beauty. That we can look at that tree and you see the cohesive whole. You see the ornaments. You see the lights. You see all the little um, trinkets that the kids have made you uh, for school projects through all the years. You look at that and you see this cohesive uh, picture that is the tree is adorned. And so, Paul is saying here, for the women, you are to adorn your bodies. You are to adorn, order after, uh, decorate yourself with modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety. So, when we look at this, this word of modesty, it's the adverb form of that cosmos. It's cosmios, okay? And... Uh, I have a favorite uh, commentary that I, that I look at, and he elaborates on the deep nature of this word. He says this, The virtue of the cosmos, however, is not the proprietary of his dress and demeanor, but of his inner life, unerring and expressing itself in the outward conversation. Do you see that? In this word, it's not so much an adorning of the outward man that is the focus of it, but there is the adorning of the inward man, an ordering of the affections of the heart, an ordering of the things of the mind as pertaining to uh, life and how we act and how we order our lives in the Lord. There is an inward order that we must adorn our hearts with. Does that make sense? And so Paul is not calling attention to the outward only, but he does deal with the outward uh, appearance, but he is first and foremost addressing the inner heart. 
And you see, that is really grace at its finest. Because if we address the outside, if we address our actions without ever addressing the heart, the heart attitude about what's going on, we are no better than the Pharisees. We're no better than the legalistic uh, Pharisees and, and religiously high-minded people of the nation of Israel, where we're focused on the outward actions and, look, I'm, I'm keeping everything. But in their hearts, in their faith, the, the religious leaders were, were blind. They were without faith. Their hearts were a mess. We order the inward man before the outward man, is what Paul is alluding to us here. So we continue on in this passage that he, he encourages the women to, that they would dress in modest apparel. Remember how I said that there are some core desires that every woman has. One of, uh, two of those core desires uh, kind of express themselves like this. I look at my little daughters every day. I think of little Alexis. She wakes up every morning, and whenever she wakes up, she wants to get up, and she wants to get dressed. She gets up, she gets dressed, she puts on the same pair of blue shorts every morning. We have to wiggle them away from her so she can get new ones on. And she puts them on, and then she'll say, Look at me, Daddy. I got dressed. You see me? Look. You see me? I, I did it myself. You see my nails? She tells that to me probably 15 times. My other daughter, Sophia, she's a different girl. She doesn't like shorts. She loves dresses. She's the one that's always putting on uh, princess dresses. Or she finds a, a, a skirt. She'll put it on. What does she do? Spin. Twirl. Do you see me, Daddy? Aren't I pretty? Do you love me? Look at this. Aren't I captivating to you? You see, my girls aren't unique. They are unique. But they're not different than, than uh, so many of what little girls, uh, what is etched into the heart of every little girl. And if, when those, those questions aren't answered, when those questions aren't met with the truth of, yes, honey, I see you. I got you. Yeah, you do captivate me. I love you. You're beautiful. And when that isn't taken and transferred to the Lord, the Lord sees you. He created you. You're perfect in his son, Jesus Christ. When that doesn't happen, that question, those questions, we've got to find some kind of answer for them. How do we, how, how do we find an answer for that? Well, I can find an answer for that by just pulling my boss down just a little bit. Don't you see me? Or maybe I can put on my tight clothes. So you see, there's nothing left to the imagination at all. Don't you see me? Or maybe I can put on lots and lots of makeup and I can paint my face and I can pretend to be a different part. Don't you see me? Aren't I beautiful? Can I captivate you? When these questions go unanswered, the human heart will seek to fulfill that need to find those answers in any way, shape, or form possible. And it's to that end that the Apostle Paul steps in and he says, no, that's not where you need to go. Look at verse uh, um, 9, at the end of verse 9, he says that this adorning yourself in a godly manner, it's not with braided hair, it's not with gold, it's not with pearls, it's not even with fancy, expensive clothes, costly array. P Paul says that is not where it's at. If you're not coming to God, if you're not coming to order your heart after him, like we've been talking about, if we're not adorning ourselves that way, that is where you're left to go. And that's why in the church, and as the church, and as individuals in the body of Christ, we must step in and say, no, look, here's your end goal. Here's your end result. This is where you need to go. Take that desire to be seen, to be beautiful, to be adored. Take it to the Lord. Because he surely does. To 
take it to him. It's not with any of those things, but rather what? Verse 10. But which becometh women, professing godliness with good works. You see, a woman is to be adorned by God in modesty. But that modesty takes shape in godliness. Adorn yourself as a woman of God in godliness. Now, while we're on this idea of modesty and uh, the, the way a woman dresses, it's easy, like I said, to stand here and give you a bunch of checklists. For you as a woman, it, you are immodest if you do X, Y, and Z. That's not what we're going to do this morning. We're going to encourage you that that is a heart decision that between you and the Lord. But my wife pointed out a very key verse to me that really challenged me in this idea of modesty. And it's this, that a woman possesses a very special, a very unique power with her body. In fact, go back to the creation account. When God created man, when he created Adam, and Adam said, I'm missing something. There's nothing like me. And God said, I got your back. And he put him to sleep, and he, he took of that rib. He created woman. And when he brought Eve to Adam, what did Adam say? Whoa, man. Her beauty captured him. Her beauty uh, was just, just ravished Adam. And so this beauty that a woman possesses, you don't have to spend too much time looking at the television, looking at the tabloids, that this beauty is twisted and distorted and exploited because it's not being filtered by God. It's not being refined by the Spirit of God. This beauty is a power. Would you turn with me? This is a wonderful cross-reference. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Before you get out the spears, I know this is not exactly what the passage is talking about, but there's a great, fantastic principle for us here in this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and Paul is speaking about his own apostolic authority. The fact that he was given a power and a calling and a mission above anybody else that put him in a league of his own. And he's saying, he's explaining how he used, or rather did not use, that power. But there's a great principle for us to digest and to latch onto when it comes to the, uh, the feminine, the power of feminine beauty. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? This is where we really want to hit on in this verse. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. My wife shared this verse with me in the sense that she has an amazing power with the beauty, and it is a beauty that God's given her. She has an amazing power, but she is not going to use that power to hinder anyone else, but rather she, and she does not want to use that power to hinder, to lead astray, to thwart the very gospel of God that saves men and women from an eternity paying for their own sins in the lake of fire. She is not going to use that as a power. Women, you have a power through your unique feminine body. When Paul asks us and teaches us that we are to adorn ourselves modestly, it's of the inward heart, it's of the inward man, and that works itself out into godliness. And we use this power not for the desires of our own heart, not for the fulfilling of our own flesh, and not for the hindering of others, but we use it for the glory of God. Do you get that? You as a woman are created to bear the image and give the glory to God. Men, listen up. 
Give, your, give God the glory for the wives in your life, for how they project the image of God. So we continue to move through our passage. In Paul, we once again see that he reminds us that we are to focus not on these external, these outward things, but rather that which becometh godliness uh, with good works. We're not going to go there right now, but I'm reminded of Ephesians chapter 2, uh, 8, 9, 10, in that, in that range in there, where we are created unto good works. There is a reason that God has redeemed his church. There is a reason that we are saved, and we are saved so that others may be saved, and that we may do good works. We may do God works. He says after that, for we are his, God's, workmanship. You know what a workmanship is? It's a project. You are God's project. As a woman of God, you are God's project that you would adorn yourself according to him and that you would shine him uniquely in a way that no other woman can shine for him the way you can. You are God's project. Are you allowing him to work on you today? Women, you are adorned by God. We move on in our passage to verse 11. Paul says, Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Good. We made it through the second round of no spears. When we look at this passage, what is Paul saying when he looks at this? Because we can look at this and we look at some of these words and we think, wow, isn't that pretty severe? Well, I mean, we were just talking that Eve, that, that the woman is the, the crown of all creation and you're beloved, you're adored, and, and now, don't talk, be quiet, sit there. No, that's not what we're talking at all about. See, we need to understand a little bit of context. We need to understand a little bit of the, uh, the wording that is also present here for us. When Paul says, let the, uh, the women learn in silence. Do you think that word silence means don't utter a single thing at all? That's what some take it to mean. But that is not uh, the sense of the word at all. Keep your hand here in this passage. But let's look at it used elsewhere in Scripture. Turn to the left, just a couple pages, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And verse 11. Paul says there's a problem going on with the Thessalonians here, that there were some, some people that were causing havoc, that they were not doing things according to God's plan, according to God's design. Verse 11, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, and working not at all, but are busybodies. They're troublemakers. Verse 12, what's the answer to these people that are going around walking disorderly, that are causing and wreaking chaos in that assembly? Verse 12, now then that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with silence they work and eat their own bread. Is that what our passage says? No. What does it say? Quietness. So there's an idea to this word that you understand the context of how this word is used. It's not silence. It's do, don't speak, woman. It's not the sense that Paul gives. That is never the place. In fact, under God's grace, women are elevated to the place that they belong as, as the gems of God's creation. But it's in the context of being disorderly, of being unruly. He says, in quietness, 
that these people are to be commanded. So not silence, not uttering a single thing, but in quietness. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 now. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And in this passage, we also have another instance in which there was a lot of chaos going on in this church. At this time, there were still uh, the supernatural sign gifts going on, and uh, the way that people were handling those gifts, it was out of control. It was creating and wreaking havoc. It was disorderly. And Paul is going to recap. He says it several times in several different ways throughout the passage. But uh, verse 40 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is going to summarize it best for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 40, Paul says this, Let all things be done decently and how? In order. So, we bear this principle in mind. When we go back and we look at the text in 1 Timothy chapter 2, when the women are instructed specifically, they are called out onto the carpet here, and he says that they are to learn in silence with all subjection. We're not pounding a hammer and, and giving edicts here. We are giving principles that help flesh out this idea, let all things be done decently and in order. There was chaos that was going on uh, in these churches where uh, women were stepping over their bounds that God has created and given them. And so Paul's saying, no, 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 that's not how things work at all. Things are to be done. Uh, one after the other. Not a big free-for-all. And secondarily, he says that when uh, somebody else is speaking, that, you know, have you ever had a problem of cutting somebody off while you were uh, speaking to them? There are proverbs about uh, a fool only wishing to express only uh, what's on his own mind. It's kind of the idea that I get here, that as we... As, as these believers were together, uh, you can have a teacher teaching. And I get the picture that there were women in the church who would uh, be disruptive, who would be disorderly, and who would stand up and say, No, but the, that, 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 are you sure about that? That there was a, a disorderliness, there was a disruption about how, what was going on, uh, how the, the church service, how the teachings were going on. And Paul is, is putting that to rest. He says, let the woman learn in silence with subjection. Now that word subjection is also another very interesting word. It's very closely related to another word that is almost a dirty word in our society. That word subjection is closely akin to submission. In fact, it's just a couple letters different in our Greek language of, of the two words. Very closely related to submission. Now we know, if you're a, a note taker this morning, I'll offer you several other passages uh, that I want you to look at. But submission, this idea of subjection, first means to order under. I think of an umbrella. It rains here at Cedar Lake just about every single day while we're here at conference. And when you have an umbrella, what does it do? It protects you, doesn't it? It protects you from the elements. If I had an umbrella here, but I'm holding it off to the side, is that umbrella doing its job? No. But if I order myself under, if I take my steps, my orderly steps that I walk, if I orderly walk over and I place myself under this umbrella, I order under that umbrella, am I going to get wet now? No. I'm going to stay dry. That protection, me submitting myself, placing myself under that umbrella, is me placing myself in a place where I can be protected. And so that is really at the heart of, of submission, is when we submit ourselves, submission is just not for women. Submission is for all believers. 
And you can take a look at Romans chapter 13, where we are to submit to the authorities, to the powers, to government, that we are all instructed to submit to these powers, order ourselves under them. We also have that, that we as members of the body of Christ are to submit ourselves to Christ himself in Second Corinthians, um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 13 explains that we submit ourselves to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.15 says that we are not supposed to submit ourselves to false doctrine, but we are to submit ourselves to that which is true, to sound doctrine, as we've alluded to here this week. In Ephesians chapter 5, we see that the church, the body of Christ, is in submission to Christ himself. Submission is not a dirty word. Submission is a safe word. It's a word that gives us protection because it's what God has uh, asked us. It's what God has commanded. We're designed for that, and it protects us naturally from it. We also see specifically that women are asked to submit. Not just the men, but women. Specifically, if you were to look in Ephesians chapter 5, that women are to submit to their husbands. It's with that thought in mind that we look back in our passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. So far, we've been discussing this in terms of the church. And Paul says, let the woman learn in silence. Notice, does it say women or woman? It says woman. Let the woman learn uh, in silence with all subjection. Verse 12, but I suffer not women or a woman. A woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the men. The man. Oftentimes, the, the words for husband and wife are the same as man and woman. I think there is an element, while we are looking at a pastoral epistle, we're looking at the church and how women behave and order themselves in the church, I think there's also a strong case and a strong point to be made that we're also looking at the family here, because really, Paul doesn't even start to get into the nitty-gritty of, of the church things until uh, ver chapter 3, when he starts talking about elders in the church. I think we're talking about straight-up women right here, and women in relation to their husbands. Let the woman learn in subjection, uh, in silence, or, or with quietness, with decent order, with all submission. And look at verse 12. I suffer not a woman to teach. And the idea of that is not just, um, just a one-time thing to say like, hey, have you ever seen this from the scriptures before? That's not what he's saying. He's saying here, I suffer not a woman to teach continuously, and repeatedly. The idea of a woman taking a leadership role either in the church or in the home, that they're the ones taking the job and the role of I am going to be the teacher. Paul says, I, I suffer not a woman to do that. When he says suffer, that, that has the idea of to turn over. Paul says, I'm, I'm not handing over the reins to the women to do this. I teach, as part of uh, my job description, I have the privilege of teaching uh, classes in my job. And, and recently I taught uh, a series of courses uh, to people outside of my discipline, but that are, are their nurses, though. And so as I'm teaching these nurses, and I, I'm teaching them, I'm giving them uh, in-depth things, and I had somebody raise their hand and ask me a question. And they wanted to know the, the intricate uh, the depths of, of this idea. And they wanted to know, what should I do in this situation? And I paused the class and I said, whoa, whoa, hold up. You are smart. You're capable. You're very, uh, you're able to understand the answer. And you know what? Outside of class, I'm going to share that answer with you. But you need to stop right there because you 
you do not have that scope of practice. You don't have the authority to do what you're asking to do. And in the United States, we license all kinds of different jobs. Doctors are licensed to practice medicine. But one doctor can't do everything. They have a specific scope of things that they are allowed to do and allowed not, or not allowed to do. And that is in accordance with how they are equipped, with how they are trained, with the experiences that they have, for all intents and purposes, for how they've been molded and created as doctors, as nurses, as whatever discipline you're speaking of. When it comes to men and women, we each have a scope of practice. Men, we have a scope that we can't do what a woman is supposed to do because I'm not equipped to do it. I don't have the tools to do it. And women, likewise, are not to overstep the boundaries of their scope, of who God has created them to be, because they don't have the abilities. They don't have the training. They are not created for that role. And that is the idea that Paul is expressing when he says, I suffer not a woman. I'm not turning it over to the women to teach continually on a repeated basis, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence, but to be in that quietness and that orderly conduct. <clears throat> the issue is not of ability. I know many women who will probably have IQs much greater than myself and probably much greater than the men collectively in this room. It's not an issue of uh, capability or ability. It is an issue of God-created order. It is an issue of God-created design and purpose. I could have a beautiful instrument. I could take one of uh, the, the Wilkinson ladies as they get up here and they have their beautiful instrument. It's, and it's wonderful. They have a beautiful violin and I, and I have it and it's gorgeous. It's extremely capable. But if I take that violin and say, let's play a good beat, how's that going to go? I'm going to take that thing that is beautiful and that is perfectly capable and when I use it against its purpose, it's a no-go. It ruins it. That's the idea. Paul says, don't go against the way that I have created you. This is your purpose. So, women, it is not the place for women to teach continually, to, to have that leadership role in the teaching, in the leading of an assembly over the men. And why is that? Well, Paul gives us an answer. He refers us back to where we started our entire talk this morning. He takes us back to creation. Verse 13. For Adam was first formed, and then Eve. They were right there. See, there was an order. Adam was created as the leader. And in fact, when uh, Eve was created, she was created to be his help meet. A suitable helper. An acceptable helper for Adam. The wife need not lead. The women need not lead in the church because that's not what you're created for. You are created to be the helper of your husband. The, um, and that is not a demeaning place at all. That is an amazing place. That is the place that you are created for. <clears throat> We go on, verse 14. Sorg is a little hairy here, and he says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. If you want a good reason why Eve wasn't to lead, is because, you know what? She tried it. Eve tried to lead. And it didn't go so well, did it? She's, she found the fruit of the tree, and she took and she gave it to her husband, Adam, who was with her. And she said, let's have at it. Let's go. She brought up. She was deceived first, and then Adam. And 
there's a point to be made here. Yes, we're talking about women and the fact that, yes, Eve made that fatal mistake first. She tried to take the lead. And the problem is, Adam let her take the lead, didn't he? The biblical account in Genesis talks about when Adam, who was with her, that idea of with has the idea that his elbow was right up against Eve, that he was there with her. He was physically present with her. It's not like Adam was out working in the back tool shed and saying, oh, well, my wife did this and uh, I guess I might as well join her. He was right beside her when she fell. He went passive. He didn't say, hey, Eve, that's not a good idea. That is not what God told us to do. No. Adam went silent. Adam went passive. Men, we go silent. We go passive. We don't stand up. We don't take the role that God has created for us. And when we don't take the role that God has created for us, and when we don't walk into that place that we are created for, guess who will all too easily and all too willingly? Eve. The women in our lives, our wives, the women in the church will step up if the men do not. Men, let us not fail to step up. This account back in Genesis, Eve did overstep her bounds. As a, as a result, a curse was placed upon all man and uh, man and woman specifically. Adam, we were given the task uh, that we, in our toil, uh, in, in working the ground, it was going to become so much more laborious. It was going to become so much more difficult. And for Eve, her desire now was going to be what? To roll over her husband. But she can't, because that's not what she was created to be. But that desire is still there for her to roll over her husband. But you know, God, in his infinite grace, his wonderful grace, he has given women an out. That ruling idea, that, that, that heart of, uh, let me help, I want to control, let me teach, let me do that. Verse 15. God blesses women with a domain of their own. Verse 15. Notwithstanding, she, the woman, shall be saved, shall be delivered from this desire, shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. You see, God extends an offer that is so amazing, that is so priceless. What better legacy to be able to leave as a woman of God than to leave the legacy of a godly child and to leave the legacy of godly children who from there can continue to grow up and become adults in this world and they go off and they marry and then they create more godly children after that. Do you see the far-reaching effects from one godly woman that can have. We didn't look at it, but you can easily look at it in 2 Timothy. Paul praises Timothy's mother and grandmother. And that those women had the opportunity to feed into young Timothy. And that laid the foundation, that laid the, the groundwork for the Apostle Paul to come into his life. And for young Timothy then to become a leader of the faith, a leader of the very age and dispensation of the grace of God. Those women were a part of that ministry. A 
Aquila and Priscilla, if you were to look in the book of Acts, they're also mentioned later on in the book of Romans as well. Aquila and Priscilla, Priscilla, a wife capable, very competent in the scriptures, helped to lead others to a more full knowledge of the grace of God, but she did it in the proper godly context with her husband beside her and through the ministry of their home, through the ministry of their family. God uses women. God uses women because he's created women. And the opportunity you have is to mold and to demonstrate the character, the very image of God as women in your homes to your children. Sharing with them the wonderful truths, God's grace, God's love, God's goodness, the very character of God you have the opportunity. This is your role. But let me tell you, this is your privilege to be able to do that. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we do thank you. Once again, I pray for my sisters that are present with us this morning. Father, they may be struggling. Maybe, maybe they're here and their husbands, they aren't taking the lead. Father, that's a difficult place to be in. Father, I ask that uh, through your power that they would be equipped to continue to submit to you, to submit to their husbands and, and work through that difficult decisions, through the, the difficult circumstances that, that is going on. Father, I pray for the women here who uh, are uh, in, a, in a wonderful relationship with a believing husband. Father, I ask that through the, through the two of them combined that they would be able to uh, enhance and to adorn the, your grace and to adorn um, themselves with, with godliness, with you, bearing your image to the world. Father, there's also a lesson here for my fellow brothers and myself. Father, I pray that we as men will continue to step up into the leadership roles, into the places that you have created us uh, to take uh, the role, the leading role in, in our homes, Father, in our churches, in our assemblies, Father, and uh, that as we do so, we would function as, and as the body of Christ in the way that you have created us to. Father, that shines out your grace, that shines because it's what we were created to do. Father, we give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. And it's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen.